Thank you guys for tuning in. I am Sabrina Hinnett, and I'm the lead organizer of the Whistler Forest March, as well as a volunteer with the Whistler Naturalist and a local forest bathing guide. I'd like to begin with gratitude by acknowledging that we are here today in Whistler on the overlapping traditional unceded territories of the Squamish and Lil'wat nations. Thanks so much to everyone who joined us at Lost Lake today to march in solidarity with the land and water in an effort to put an immediate stop to old growth logging in BC. I'd also like to thank everyone who has helped make this possible, Jennifer, Karen, and everyone else who helped organize the BC Forest March Movement, Christina Swern for co-organizing, and Bob Brett for all your help and expertise, and all of the other Whistler Naturalist board members who supported hosting this event, Claire Reddy and Natasha Way from AWARE for making this webinar possible, Brad from the Whistler Museum, Julie Burrows and Jeanette from the Whistler Public Library, Alyssa Noel from The Peak for covering our story, all of the volunteers who helped us out today, Jamie, Sasha, Abby, Sammy, um, Heather, Allison, and Mandy from the Squamish Lillette Cultural Center, Heather and Jillian from the Resort Municipality of Whistler, City Councilor Kathy Jewett and Mayor Jack Crompton for your support from a distance, Corporal Nathan Miller for your support from the RCMP and Garibaldi Graphics, and especially all of our speakers who are with us today, Tech Georgina, Dan, Christina, Bob, Claire, and Arthur. Um, thank you all so much. We join communities today across the province, including Victoria, Powell River, Nanaimo, Comox Valley, Nelson, Peachland, Gabriola Island, Golden, Salmon Arm, Vernon, Salt Spring Island, and Oceanside Park, Parksville to unite for the forest. It's time to build a new forest framework that respects nature and indigenous systems and gives power back to communities. I'm going to speak a little bit more about that at the end of our live stream, so be sure to stick around to hear what I've found out to be some of the most shocking facts about BC's current forestry model from the BC Forest to People Convergence Online Summit. I'm going to now turn things over to Christina Swern, who is a biologist and longtime volunteer with the Whistler Naturalist. At the University of Victoria, she trained as a botanist as an undergrad undergrad and studied the effects of climate change on alpine environments for her master's project. She has worked as a field biologist, teaching assistant, executive director of the Sea to Sky Invasive Plant Council, and is a certified interpretive guide. She currently she's currently the manager of the Discover Nature program at the Whistler Museum and is self-employed as a nature interpreter. Over to you, Christina. Thank you, Sabrina, uh, for the intro. Uh, so my name is Christina, and I was proud to be part of the Forest March today, because I'd like to help bring attention to the fact that BC is still logging old growth forests, even though there's only a small fraction of them remaining. I think it's unfortunate, very unfortunate, that we've come to know our forests as natural resources, as if they only exist for our uses. Uh, helpful, I think, to take a step back now and again to remember that humans are just one animal um, that we sh and we share this planet with millions of others um, organisms as well. You might have heard that forests are a renewable resource, so what's the big deal? Well, young forests may be renewable, old forests are not. It takes about 250 years for true old growth forests to develop. And if those forests were logged and for some reason they were given 250 years to recover, although the chances of that are slim, the climate would be so different that we'd have different soils and different plants. It would be completely different than today. So say again, um, old growth logging is not renewable. Not only are we cutting down a thousand year old trees, we're also permanently destroying a unique ecosystem that countless species depend on. Isn't it amazing that in BC, trees can live to over 1,000 years? Thanks to research done by Bob Brett, who we'll hear from in a bit, we know that the oldest living tree in Whistler is a 1,200-year-old yellow cedar that lives in the Callahan Valley up at the top of the ski jumps in the Whistler Olympic Park. It should also be noted that this tree was found um, in an area that, according to the provincial maps of ages of the trees, the ages of the trees were only supposed to be 140 to 250 years old. So 
mapping of tree ages is something that needs to be worked on in the future. Um, but just back to the 1200 year old tree, it's hard to really appreciate how old that is. And sometimes I like to relate it back to human history. So that 12,000 year, 1200 year old tree that was in the Callahan, it was already almost 700 years old before European colonization. Like that's incredible to me. I mean, think back to your own family tree. You'd have to go back at least 40 generations to find someone who was alive when that tree started growing. Um, if you had an heirloom from that long ago, it would be priceless. But why is it today that we don't treat our old growth forests with the same awe and reverence? <coughs> reverence might seem an over the top kind of word for those who might not have been able to appreciate an old growth forest. For example, it's when you're walking the Chequemus Lake Trail and you're paying attention when you do the transition from the second growth to the old growth forest. It feels completely different. And I love to pause there just to appreciate exchanging air with these forest elders. Um, or for example, it's when you hike up to the ancient cedars and you suddenly find this grove of gigantic trees that take your breath away. And speaking of the ancient cedars, many people don't realize that those trees were slated to be cut down for shakes and shingles of all things. Um, and the only reason they were saved was that the community got together and pressured the government to save these big old trees. So I hope we can do the same thing now, um, put pressure on the provincial and local governments to immediately stop um, our continued old growth logging. It does, um, it does make me sad sometimes how much destruction humans can do to the earth, but I also know we are capable of so much positive action. I love the way um, Jane Goodall speaks about stewardship. Um, if you've heard the term, think globally, act locally, um, she says, here this is what she says, she says, no, twist it around because quite honestly, if you can think globally, you get depressed with the harm we're inflicting. Just act locally and see what a difference you can make. So if you haven't already, I hope you'll speak up for the old growth force that you love, either by signing a petition, volunteering for a conservation group, writing to your government, or, or another idea. Together, we can make a difference. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Christina. Okay, the next person we have joining us today is Hector Gina Dan of the Lowat Nation. She's the Cultural Administration Coordinator at the Squamish Lowat Cultural Center and is very involved in the Lowat culture. She grew up spending time with her parents, gathering various resources from the territory, and she remembers watching her dad prepare to go hunting and parishes preparing raw deer hide when he brought home his catch. Georgina started dancing traditional Lil Wet style at a very young age and continues to dance both at work and for pleasure. In 2019, Georgina apprenticed with Melvin Williams to learn about weaving with cedar roots and inner cedar bark practices that blended her love of culture with the outdoors. Thank you so much, Georgina, for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I would like to properly introduce myself in the language and introduce uh, the territories that we are on. Uh, so I just said is hello. My traditional name is Kluch. English translation is sweet. But my English name is Georgina and I'm from the Lilwat Nation. Uh, within the Shatlian territory. It is nice to be here today, and I'm speaking the language of the Shatlian people. Today I wanted to talk a little bit about how, the importance of the cedar trees and the Douglas fir trees for the Squamish and the Lilwat peoples. Uh, the cedar tree is something that's very dear to my heart. As you can see, my headband here is made out of cedar. Um, I'm personally am a cedar weaver. I'm quite new at it actually. Um, I was able to do a mentorship alongside of master weavers and I didn't know the importance of the cedar tree or the old growth trees until I was amongst them. You do have to journey quite long until you 
you can uh, be amongst them. And I feel that's the reward. Um, it's such a different feeling once you're amongst all the old growth trees. Um, for the cedar tree, uh, for these two nations, it's known as the tree of life or the lifelong giver, as it does give us a lot of our daily needs throughout our lifetime. We can use every single part of the tree uh, once it's cut down, but while it's still standing, we could only harvest some of the bark and some of the roots. We'll only harvest um, as much as uh, two handbits. That's usually um, as much as I can, uh, anybody can take. And it does have to be an old enough tree. Uh, for these two nations, we often just give it a nice big hug. If my fingers are touching, it's far too young. Often we'll just go to the next tree. Uh, we can use the bark, the roots, the inner wood for many of our different needs. Um, I personally like to weave um, baskets. I'm currently weaving a hat. Often when we harvest from the trees, we acknowledge that the, the life that it has and we'll only take as much as we need. We only take uh, from the tree once uh, per our lifetime, uh, just to cherish the spirit of that tree as well. Not only these two nations actually harvest from the cedar tree, many of uh, First Nations people here on the Northwest Coast will actually do so. Uh, so the cedar tree is quite meaningful for a lot of Indigenous peoples here. Uh, as a Litlap person, I do want to acknowledge uh, Shrap Ool. Shrap Ool in my language is the real tree um, in translation. It's the tree that grows the highest. For the Litlat Nation, we used to be known as Shrap Ool uh, because we would acknowledge um, our peoples by once it's time for them to be laid to rest, we will actually bury them. Um, traditionally, we would bury them inside of the roots of the Douglas fir tree. Um, with the Douglas fir growing the, uh, the tallest, we believe uh, that the spirit of our people will actually be carried through the tree to be closer to the creator. These trees are quite meaningful for many of these nations. Um, I know with the Squamish and the Lilt-Wat nations, our languages are oral, um, traditionally. We didn't actually have them written down until quite recently, so we often look to our lens to be able to understand our history a little bit more. And I'm so excited to be able to be invited to speak am amongst uh, these old growth trees uh, because it is uh, something that has helped me grow as an Indigenous person uh, with uh, knowledge from the, straight from these trees and just grow as an individual. I'm so thankful to be able to be able to talk uh, on the cedar tree as a weaver. Uh, this is my lifestyle. I, I do try to protect the trees as much as I can, um, especially when I'm harvesting from them. Uh, these trees are what helps our, con our traditions to be able to continue to uh, grow and for us to be able to share and learn. So thank you for everyone for taking the time to be able to listen to me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Georgina. That was beautiful. And I really love your headband. It's amazing. Yeah. I feel like we can learn so much from the Indigenous peoples who've been here for since the millennia. <laughs> Okay, so thank you again. We are going to now speak to Claire Reddy um, from Whistler's Environmental Group, AWARE. There you Hi. are. Hi. Got it? Hi, Claire. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hi. Um, thank you to the naturalist, Sabrina, and the team for putting this on. Um, and um, you know, I'm, I'm zooming in from um, quarantine with some parents visiting from the UK, so I'm sorry to miss the march, but um, this uh, issue of old growth has been something that has been 
um, near and dear to um, my heart personally, but also to um, the role that I play with um, AWARE, Whistler's uh, Environmental Charity for the last 30 years. And I think that what's um, one of the experiences that I really um, value is hearing some of the stories from things that have happened in the past and um, being able to hear some of the stories around from previous board directors, AWARE members, community members um, about uh, the war in the woods and efforts to protect uh, the ancient cedars, areas of the Sioux Valley, areas of the Ilaho, and in some cases, those stories being about standing in front of people with chainsaws. Um, here, uh, I guess there's there's the there's the BC um, piece, which we'll get into, and and I'm sure Bob will um, cover a lot of the biodiversity values. And as Christina so eloquently put, you know, we we quite often look at um, the management of the landscape through a very anthropocentric lens. And when we come to talk about old forests and old growth and the values that these um, forests bring, there, there are so many layers that we can simply not replace in terms of the biodiversity values. And, um, and, and I'm sure that Bob will go into that. And I'd like to recognize and credit Bob for teaching me personally uh, and our community so much about our local forests and, and, and the values that are there and, and what we stand to lose. And the day that we found that 1200 year old cedar was, um, you know, it, it's, was phenomenal and I was ex really <laughs> excited to be there that day. Um, but it was 10 meters downhill from a cut block. And so you, you stand there and you realize the reality of, of losing trees that have been there for generations um, and, and for what, for, for, for money. So, um, I guess in the local context and, uh, you know, our, our, our land base, we, um, working in kind of the Whistler area of being the, the bulk of AWARE's work, since the early 2000s, um, a lot of the work here is focused around the formation and the operation of, uh, uh, of the Chequemus Community Forest. And when we look back at the um, original intentions for the formation of our local CCF, um, these were to give the three community partners, more decision-making um, powers around how the land base is used and to create employment. So in our work as AWARE um, and as an engaged community group that attends a lot of the community forest open houses, um, engages at any opportunity we're provided to try to add layers of protection through mechanisms such as um, uh, wildlife habitat areas, um, through a few years ago, the process setting uh, new areas aside through ecosystem-based management um, uh, designations. Um, we're constantly coming back to, are we really as a community forest of reaching these objectives of more and better control um, and, and creating um, employment? Um, one of the things that we've been finding um, is that uh, both through our role as AWARE and with our seat that we hold on the Forest Wildlands Advisory Committee to Council is that it can quite often be quite hard to get timely and up-to-date information on our um, local uh, forestry operations um, from through the community forest. So, um, you know, looking today and, and catching up on the latest numbers, you know, the latest data that's up there is from is two years old from 2018. And it's also uh, about the whole land base. So, you know, I think as we think about our goals as a community of how do we make sure that we're putting, um, you know, if, if we are going to be logging, how do we make sure that we are doing that in a way that is sympathetic to the landscape and um, and putting uh, things, using the landscape in a way that's of highest and best use. And then the other question we should be asking is, do we need to still be logging old growth? Um, uh, because we, our stance as aware has long, has long been that we don't believe that we should be. Um, these ecosystems are becoming more and more rare. And the thing that we are not doing is looking at the opportunity costs of um, taking out old growth. As Christina mentioned, these forests are never going to be allowed to return to 250 years plus, which is the provincial um, uh, measure of old growth, the age uh, classification of old growth. But we're not talking about trees and forests that are just 250 years old. We're talking about multi-generational forests that have trees that are thousands of years old. So um, we have a lot to lose. Um, and uh, on the um, BC scale, uh, what's interesting is that when you look at um, the data for BC, uh, BC actually generates nearly half. So uh, the 2019 report for the, the state of the forest report that is put out 
for Canada. Um, BC actually generates 41% of the volume that is um, logged across Canada. So when we, and, and, when, and when we look at that, we also can look at the number of jobs that creates. So this, you know, are we creating jobs locally? Uh, the challenge in BC is that while we're generating and contributing so much of the logging volume, we're actually not um, supporting small mill operations and medium-sized mill operations. Um, it's mostly going to large, um, uh, large mill function operations. There's a lot of exports of raw logs and, um, and when we are doing that, we're, we're, we're basically taking, not operating at max value. So if you look at somewhere like Ontario, for example, for every cubic meter of um, log volume, they actually generate five times as many, as much economic value. Um, so when we look at the BC system in which our local community forest operates, it's not set up, it no longer exists in a way that actually derives as much value for communities um, as it should do. And so then when we are looking at why are we logging, what are we gaining from it, and what are we losing, and not just, if we make sure that conversation is about what are we losing, not just from the anthropocentric, anthropocentric human lens, but the biodiversity values, the species values, the, the uniqueness of these ecosystems, then these conversations that are had at events like today with the march and um, the, the, the broader picture, I think, brings people back to this question of why are we logging? And so I think that, um, you know, as a group that does a lot of advocacy, um, I think there's a couple of things that we would, um, you know, raise it, um, and suggest to people um, as opportunities for ways to engage. And I really liked Christina's point about think local and then look at what happens global. And if we all take care of this place we call home, um, so there's a couple of things that we wanted to kind of flag because obviously if we're looking at trying to shift the dial on and, and move away from all growth logging, um, then having more voices asking for that is key to success. So marches like today, um, petitions, looking at petitions, um, supporting groups that are engaging in pushing back on all growth logging. So at the provincial scale with organizations like the Sierra Club, um, CPAWS, EcoJustice, but also at the local level. Um, there's a lot of community forests in operation now, and it is a, um, you know, we, we are supposed to be able to have more control through a community forest. Um, look for opportunities for learning. With COVID, a ton of organizations have put some amazing resources out online. Obviously, these are all being recorded, and it's a great way to really quickly get up to speed with the issue. Um, and then talk to your families and friends and people in your communities about this and, and let them know that you care, let them know that it's important to you. Seek out ways to engage in your local operations. So for us here in Worcester, that would be things like going to community, Chequemus Community Forest open houses, inputting when they have um, uh, you know, opportunities for um, public uh, comment. And each year they do put out uh, their plans for what, where, where they'll be logging and they provide information on how old each cut block is. But um, we as a community need to be more engaged in that and actually giving comments. Because when we look at the last year's report, it's that they received three comments. And I don't think that's reflective of the will in this community because we posted events on Old Forest and you know there's been 50 people, 100 people in the room. Um, so. And then the other one that I would flag is writing letters. Um, there isn't much that's that, uh, you know, the, the value of writing a letter has been described to me as a by a politician as for every letter that they get, they think that 300 people share those sentiments. So to sit down and spend an hour, half an hour writing a letter, sending it to your local politicians and, and your local, uh, you know, in this case, the community forest board, um, letting people know that you care about something, whether it's this issue or uh, anything else is really important. Um, and uh, to, to give a real example of that, the province just um, announced last weekend their new plans of, for providing more control for plastics. And that was because they got 35,000 comments in the, public, in, the, in the public comment period. So we, just, we need to do the same um, on, on, on all growth um, as this conversation continues. But yes, thank you for, um, I'll stop there because Bob's gonna be way more interesting than me. <laughs> Um, but thank you for, uh, for the invitation to be here and uh, really appreciate the efforts that everybody's putting in and um, 
I really hope that we can shift the dial on this because it feels like we've been talking about stopping all growth blogging locally for a really long time. And um, I know there's a lot of public support for that in this community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claire, uh, for your thoughtful words. Uh, you and AWARE are a fantastic resource um, for to know, to learn more about forestry and so many other great issues. So as you heard, Bob Brett is next. And Bob is a registered professional biologist and he's the founding president of the Whistler Naturalists and uh, currently a fellow board member. He has a master's of forest ecology from UBC and focused his research there on old forests. He started the Whistler Biodiversity Project in 2004 and brought the known species in Whistler from a measly 400 to over 4,000 and the list continues to grow every year. There's nobody who knew, knows more about Whistler's natural environment than Bob and I was so lucky to have him for a mentor when I started volunteering with the uh, Whistler Naturalists years ago. So Bob, over to you. Uh, first, um, hello. Um, and I, I, I for, thank you very much, Christina, for those uh, generous, maybe over generous uh, words. I appreciate it. Um, I'm mainly going to talk as a forest ecologist today. Um, and I'm going to recycle some old PowerPoints that I added to. I hope that um, uh, it'll be remotely as interesting as uh, Claire said it would be. We'll see what happens. Um, I'm going to switch over to uh, to that. Oh, uh, Sabrina, can you enable my screen sharing? Anyone? You can't screen share. Uh, anyway, so I'll, I'll just uh, just give me a shout when it's now, Pardon me? Can you try now? Ah, that worked like a charm. Perfect. And did that work on your end? As in, do you see? Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, why should we protect Whistler's old and ancient forests? And um, I'm just going to go through some of the reasons I think uh, I. I would like to talk about biodiversity a lot uh, and other reasons. I, I also want to talk about the age of forests and uh, some work that uh, I did with Clara. She was mentioning it um, on, on coring trees, which I think gives us some uh, local information and kind of ammunition, if you will, for why our forests are, are worth protecting. Um, so the can I just ask you if you can see my pointer here? Anyone? Yes, I can see it. Awesome. Okay. So the first thing, uh, and you know, from a conservation biologist perspective, the biodiversity of old growth forests is very important because it's, uh, if you think of it as a specialized habitat, like um, shorelines, the marine or wetlands, an old forest has specialist species that only do well within that that forest and, and I've got a photo of a northern goshawk here but it's really the whole panoply of uh, biodiversity whether it's um, mammals birds uh, to insects and uh, spiders mosses rare other rare plants liverworts fungi lichens uh, algae you get you get the picture it's, it's every type of life much of which we don't even know locally um, it's it, it's it's an area that um, there's many specialized species we still don't know. It's just uh, amazing to me. And so in this case, I just used Northern Goshawk as an easy example because this is, uh, this is a bird that was nesting in Whistler a few years ago um, and uh, a, a nest uh, in the comfortably numb area. You see it about 20 meters up that big Douglas fir. And if you were gonna find an area for a goshawk to have a nest, that would be perfect because it is the biggest tree with a large branch up high that uh, provides a nesting platform in an area of forest that's very open that allows flyways, that allows the, this uh, forest hunting bird to fly through the forest and also an open understory so that if there are small uh, mammals, rodents or whatever on the forest floor, 
uh, they don't stand as much of a chance against a hungry goshawk. This is forest habitat that does not exist in log forests. So there's also water quality and flow. Uh, this is Blackcomb Creek, but the um, one thing that isn't maybe widely, widely known is that a lot of the precipitation and snowmelt actually flows under the surface of the forest uh, floor. It's unseen and then uh, tends to rise up at the, uh, at the change in slope in the valley bottom. And um, what this does is it, it filters the water and improves the water quality. If you ever want the best water for drinking, it's from an old growth forest. It also um, modulates flows. So it slows the flow of water, it waters the forest. So if you're thinking of uh, forest fires, it sure would be good to have more watering in the, of the forest uh, and prevents drought. So if you, if you put in logging roads, that intercepts that subsurface flow, brings it to the surface into ditches and then into creeks and basically uh, dries out the, the forest below. The obvious one locally is, uh, of course, recreation. I think we all, all came here for the lifestyle um, and that involves old forests. Our best experiences are in old forests, whether it's uh, skiing the trees in the uh, subalpine or even below, uh, hiking, mountain biking in, in old forests, and, or forest bathing, like Sabrina was talking about, uh, fungus hunting, uh, and all the, all the economic um, benefits uh, from that. The uh, climate change is maybe another one that isn't talked about a lot in relation to old forests. And, and I want to focus on two things. One is that uh, temperate uh, rainforests, the ones that tend to be on the, the coast, like uh, we're, we're at the edge of the temperate rainforest where the biggest trees are and the fewest fires, longest uh, duration between big disturbances. So you get very old, uh, very large trees uh, and, and different species as a result. Um, the, 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 uh, sorry, the, uh, the, so the, in terms of climate change, the, uh, the, the carbon storage in those forests is enormous. And of course, carbon is a major contributor to climate change. And, um, another point about that is species shift. If you, um, w when you log an old growth forest, you're not going to get the same assemblage of species back. It's, they will be more likely to be general species coming in. And some of those specialist species will potentially lost forever. So we can slow the uh, effects of climate change. We can slow the effects of species shift by not logging old growth. And um, for locals, uh, just think of the number of places that you can look across the, to the mountainside. And you see a lot of um, textures and colors when you do that. In this case, it's from the peak of Whistler looking across. And you'll see that there is, uh, oh, all right, there we go. Um, so you see this line, approximate line there of uh, young forest below this dark, uh, lighter green and uh, darker forest above this darker. Uh, the reason it's darker is because it's photosynthesizing less, more slowly, uh, but at the same time it's star storing much more carbon. You see that uh, kind of clean blanket of dark green, that's all old forest and what would have been here before, uh, well not before contact, before European settlement in the early 1900s. So what does that look like on the ground? Uh, ground? Uh, this is kind of an extreme example, but it makes the point. On the left is a 60 year old uh, second growth stand in Cadenwood, which um, is obviously a fire hazard. And so we're, we've done some fuel reduction there, but you see uh, trees are, are very similar sized, very dense, um, so dense that they don't let light to the forest floor and as a result there's very little life. Uh, we call it a biological desert as a result. You may find uh, the occasional squirrel in there um, or robin, stellar's jay at the edge of the forest, but really there's not much happening inside as a result of this and it won't change for many decades without intervention because um, forests are slow to develop in Whistler. So after 250, 300 years, you get the sort of forest type you see on the right, this unlogged forest. This is another valley bottom forest that's about 350 years old. Very wide space, large trees, mossy understory because there's light passing through the canopy. Uh, there could be some small trees, some shrubs like blueberries. It's a very different structure that supports uh, different, different uh, species. And as I mentioned, much more likely to support the specialist species that are at risk. So 
this is a question that's interests me for a long time and how old are Whistler's original forests? So uh, for the last couple of decades, I and uh, Claire, uh, Claire and other excited uh, assistants who have been increasing their uh, muscular strength uh, through this process have been helping me core uh, a thousand trees in the area. And I just want to present some of the results and also talk to you about um, a publication from it. So just so you know what it looks like to uh, core a tree, use this hollow borer, you core into the middle of the tree. This is an 800 year old tree from the Callahan. You take an extracting tool, pull it out gently so it doesn't break. And then this, this particular uh, core that I'm pulling out here was over 600 rings in that distance. And if you look at the bottom right here, you'll see in the width of uh, your index finger, since pennies are obsolete, there's about 40 rings. Uh, in that width, I've seen 100 rings. It's, uh, these, uh, these yellow seeds in particular are extremely slow growing. And uh, anyway, it gives you an idea of how you find out how old a tree is. And as a result, we ended up with, um, I'm just going to show you in person here, but this is the, uh, this is the publication that AWARE put together. Uh, thank you to Claire for her help writing and putting it together. Um, it, it has a map on the back. Trust me on that one and then individual descriptions of different areas and the, and the ages. And so I didn't talk with Claire about this beforehand, but if uh, I, you can borrow that from the library. The goal isn't to make money, although if you do want to help support this sort of work, you can go to Armchair Books and buy it for about $10, uh, $12. And um, the, the real purpose to get is to get people out into the woods and, uh, and appreciating our old growth even more. Uh, there, everything's accessible by hiking or biking, and um, I really encourage you to uh, get, take a look at the at least take a look at the map and maybe get some ideas of of where to go. So hold on a second here. Hmm. So uh, just give you some examples from that map. Uh, they kind of describe the uh, different forest types of unlogged forest. So just go back to it. Anything that's been logged in Whistler is under 100 years old. Most of it's about 50 to 70 years old. So this is a reference point. And then there's a huge gap um, to these. Uh, the, the minimum age of most other uh, forests is 300 years. So by logging, we've totally changed the age distribution of our forests, which would have been predominantly old growth. Uh, before before logging started in earnest. So this is from the Emerald Forest. Um, most of the trees are about 330 years old. The, the biggest Douglas firs are coming up on 400 years and they're starting to fail. So they're, they're starting to die and be replaced by the cedars and hemlocks underneath. So it's turning into a multi-generational forest where there's uh, the, the canopy trees are starting to be the trees that grew up underneath the shade of the previous canopy trees. Uh, I'm not going to do as good a job as Christina describing uh, the magnificence of uh, walking into the uh, forest at Chuckmas Lake, uh, but I do, I do suggest you get a BC Parks Pass, the COVID Pass, so you can go for the day and uh, park the parking lot, walk through the Alder Forest across the Avalanche Track, and, and then walk into those enormous Douglas firs that are almost 600 years old. But what's amazing to me is that they're not the oldest trees in that area. If you keep on walking towards the turnoff to the bridge over the Chequemus, uh, there are hemlocks there that are closer to 800 years and possibly multi-generational forest. So very old trees to ancient trees, very easily accessible. And if you want to if you want to find the oldest trees in Whistler and some of the oldest trees literally in the world, uh, uh, the west side of Whistler is one place to go. So the, the uh, side valleys uh, from south to north, Brandywine, Callahan, 21 Mile, which is Rainbow Trail, and 16 Mile, which is where uh, there's a tiny patch of uh, a forest that hasn't been logged, uh, the ancient cedars. And then uh, the Callahan Valley, which is the, probably the biggest expanse of ancient forest 
it is currently being logged by our community forest, but there are still uh, vast tracts of, uh, of ancient forest. And to give you an idea of that, um, out of the 17 sites that we visited in Cord, not one was less than 500 years old. Most were closer to 1,000 years old or over 1,000 years old. So these are globally significant and at threat uh, from logging. So to reiterate, almost, un almost all unlogged forests are, are over 300 years old. Some are over 400 years old and some are truly ancient up to and over 1,000 years old. Um, I mentioned global significance. I, I think that uh, this is a BC-wide forest march. Um, I think that the biggest uh, focus to date of old growth has been on Vancouver Island where they have a witheringly small and continually, continually diminishing area of old growth, that spectacular old growth uh, that we'll never see again once it's gone. Uh, but it's also in the interior wet belt, um, in summerland and peachland, in caribou habitat and wells gray. But just locally, we're looking at some globally significant old growth. Uh, we should protect it. I urge you to get out there, um, enjoy it in any way you want, and um, continue this kind of discussion about how to, how to help protect it locally. Anyway, thank you. Stop share. Okay, there we go. A bit of a, a bit of a luddite. Sorry. Thank you so much, Bob. Really Can you turn the video back on? Oh, I'm just gonna intro. You turned my video off. Yeah, I know. I'm just gonna intro you guys in a sec. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Bob, for that. Really appreciate your presentation. You covered a lot of great points, and uh, we're going to come back to you. But uh, first, we're just going to go over to. Oh, let me spotlight myself. There we go. Hi, everyone. Um, we are just going to go over now to speak with Arthur um, Dijong, who's been with Whistler Blackcomb for 40 years and through various roles including Ski Patrol Manager and Mountain Operations Manager for Blackcomb. Arthur has expertise on climate change strategy, which includes working with all levels of government, including the UN. Arthur pioneered work in the area of environmental planning on Whistler Blackcomb, which has led him to his current position of Senior Manager of Planning. He's also a City Councillor um, for the Resort Municipality of Whistler and is here to speak on their behalf today about our local Chequemish Community Forest that is co-managed by the Resort Municipality of Whistler Squamish Nation and Lowat Nation. So I'm just going to bring Arthur in here. And we are also going to bring Bob Brett back. He's going to ask Arthur a few questions. I don't want you to have to. Able to okay. Hi, answer. Arthur. How are you? Welcome. Hey, Sabrina, how are you? And thank you everyone for doing this today. The more pressure, the better. And I'd quickly like to recognize that I'm on the traditional territory of the Squamish and Lillooet First Nations. And Georgina, I really appreciated your connecting words in that. And uh, back to you, Sabrina. Thank you. I'm going to pass it over to Bob now. Uh, you'd like me to start with questions? Yeah, unless Arthur wants to start with anything else. Oh, Bob, go for it. First off, I want to know where you got your scarf. <laughs> oh, it's a, well, there's a lot of these on, on WB. Yeah, it looks good on you. You get up and you put it on. Kind of, kind of like underwear, actually, these days, so I don't forget. But. Um, I've got a response, but I won't, I won't make it. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so I, I've got three questions here. I, um, there's a preamble then a question, so I don't mean to uh, do all the talking, but just to kind of set it up, please add to uh, wherever you want and answer whichever question you want. Um, so 
that you mentioned the Chakamas Community Forest, the CCF, uh, and it was formed by the three partners you mentioned, Lillewat, Squamish, and the RMOW. And uh, since it was created, the CCF has targeted old growth forests for logging and almost the, all the volume cut has been from those irreplaceable old forests. This is not new to, news to you. So, and um, the CCF plans, to, uh, based on their plans, they will keep logging similar old and ancient forests for the foreseeable future. So the question is, uh, how do we get a commitment from the CCF to end old growth logging immediately? Um, my sense of this is that um, I, th I believe, listening to the community, listening to uh, our RMOW staff, our counselors, uh, the commitment is there. It's how do we actually uh, make that step and stop um, logging old growth here? Uh, during my election, it came up you know, frequently, uh, the concern, and uh, I hope through this term, we can get you know, the job done. When I, when I hear the term community forest, what does that really mean? It means reflecting being the values of the community. And in many things that we have to deal as counselors uh, politically, there's, there's often uh, opposing sides. I don't see that at all here in this community. You know, we, we want to stop logging old growth. There are some, some barriers uh, with the, uh, the provincial framework that we're, we're uh, held under. And so there's certainly steps, there are hurdles that we need to get over to uh, get this job done of, of no longer logging old growth. I mean, we are about nature-based tourism here. Clearly, uh, old growth, its value is standing. Uh, so we're in a very uh, uh, uncomfortable place that, and, and I, I feel bad listening to all the presenters today, thank you, that so much effort has been already made to try to uh, get over this line, and, but we're still here. I apologize for that. Yeah. Um, I, I know that there's, there is, we all know that there's, uh, there's momentum in all, in all corners. We just want to figure out how to push it over the top, of course. So one, one way to do that, and Claire touched on this, is just we're, we're really short of information. So the original mandate of the community forest was to gain control over our forest and to create a, uh, you know, kind of meaningful employment for the First Nations especially. And um, we are lacking the information for, to assess whether that's actually occurring. They, just a reminder, it wasn't originally meant to be a revenue generator, although that has been touted as one of the benefits. It was, it was mainly meant for control and for, um, and for employ local employment. So I'm just, um, as you know, uh, we've discussed this and I've discussed it with other uh, counselors and so has Claire and I'm sure others, but there's just no access to uh, annual financial reports. Uh, as far as I know, there hasn't been an annual financial report prepared for the last couple of years. It could be wrong with that. There's no individual uh, analysis of financial performance by cut block to find out um, whether, uh, you know, whether it's uh, making mother money, losing money, but more importantly, whether it's old growth, not old growth. And I think the most important thing I think that we'd all like to see, First Nations as well, is what is the employment breakdown? How many person years are created? for people living in Mount Curry, people living in Squamish versus people living in Whistler, which is all three communities great. But um, my, my understanding is that there are people from outside those three uh, who are getting uh, quite a bit of the work. So I guess the, the question is, do you, do you support full transparency for the CCF and do you see any way to make that happen in the near future? I absolutely support those requests, Bob. Um, I'll certainly you know, dig into it, look into it. Uh, I have had just in my uh, in my brief two years on council, I have uh, reviewed some of the financials. Not a lot of money involved, um, and it it is uh, proportioned equally amongst the three partners. And certainly that that's part of the challenge is is uh, making it economically work. I mean, we we do not want to hand deficits to our First Nations communities nor to our um, our our locals here, our taxpayers, uh, but it's a, that's the, certainly economics is part of the challenge, but um, 
I think to some degree, uh, we maybe need to, um, we got a noise, we may have a little noise issue here, but uh, how do we slow it down? You know, one of, the, one of the principal questions I have is, how do we slow this down in a way that once second growth is, um, I'll talk louder here, uh, is an option um, economically that, that we're not handing a, a deficit um, situation over to our partners, um, then maybe uh, we can you know, work towards what the province expects in terms of uh, the, uh, the annual cut expectations. But uh, the economics are, are minimal, uh, challenging, and you know, one, of, one of the hurdles. But back to your, sorry, back to your, your uh, principal question on transparency. Absolutely. Uh, I don't see any reason why uh, that's, not, uh, that's not public information. I will look into that. Uh, that's great. Um, yeah, the, uh, I, I've talked about this before too, is like uh, kind of wondering where, where the mandate for logging came from in the first place. Of course, the, the province requires uh, an annual allowable cut, but um, we all know that that is, um, it's unlikely that it would be enforced by the province given the billions or billion dollars a year of uh, tax revenue already from tourism and ob the obvious uh, conflict between logging and, and, uh, and ecotourism. But I guess uh, what I, I am interested in talking to you about how we, how we move into second growth in the way that is, uh, is actually um, restores the forest values rather than just does business as, as usual, but maybe that's another time. But in the meantime, given that there is a potential conflict, let's, let's just say a real conflict between uh, ecotourism and logging, not to mention wildlife, habitat, water quality, everything else, um, how do you see the CCF and uh, our local tourism economy coexisting uh, in the future? Well, I, how's our sound, by the way? I, we, we were moving around on you. We're good. Okay. Uh, Whistler is nature-based tourism. The only logging, therefore, that should take place is what A, supports recreation, and or B, protects our community. So the two conditions then are obviously with uh, the increasing fire hazard that we have with climate change. Uh, we actually need to do a lot more in terms of, of reducing the, uh, the fire threat and that does involve uh, removing uh, timber uh, in very specific uh, locations. Uh, and and respect to, with respect to uh, tourism, we do log old growth at times. So they, I mean, the history of our, uh, our trail development here, our ski runs, our cross country trails, our valley trails, but that's, that's a whole different uh, perspective than uh, purely uh, trying to meet an, an economic uh, model um, and putting old growth in harm's way. That the greatest value of old growth is, uh, as a, as a standing um, area of timber. And the, I'm gonna use an example, uh, how I feel about old growth, just walk the ascent trails. You and I have um, you know, worked on that in terms of uh, their, their tourism value, their spiritual value, their uh, value for mental health, um, the educational value. Um, so it's nonsensical to be logging old growth here except for uh, public safety and when done very responsibly uh, for recreation and, and I, I say that with you know, very careful words and that a lot of thought needs to be put in uh, even when we're doing this for recreation. Uh, now we're getting some cool sounds. Um, how do you want to how do you want to do this Sabrina? Uh, do you have any follow-up questions? Um, no, that's great from me. If you're finished, thank you so much. Um, I, I could talk forever, but yeah. <laughs> well, we think we've definitely Thanks, got a Bob. lot to absorb there. That's thank awesome. you, Arthur, for your time. Thank you, Bob. Um, 
Yeah, we really appreciate you joining us today, Arthur. I'm going to come back here now. Hi, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us today at this Whistler Forest March online event. Um, to end, I just I want to summarize a few of the things that I learned from watching the BC Forest March um, People's Conversion. It was an online summit uh, that you can still watch on the BC Forest March website. Some of the shocking things I discovered was that BC is one of the few places left in the world with an intact temperate rainforest, and we are on track to change that. There's only 0.5% of this kind of temperate rainforest left in the world. And here, more than 85% of the productive forests in BC that we have left have less than 30% of the natural expected amount of old growth. And nearly half of those have less than 1% of the amount expected naturally. And there's nothing protecting that 1% from being cut. Indigenous people have lived on these lands for over 10,000 years with a relatively stable climate. And in just the last 100 years of industrial activity and settler history, we have brought the climate and ecosystem both close to a complete collapse. Since 2004 here in BC, our forests have become a carbon source for net emissions and they release over 225 megatons of carbon dioxide per year. That's more than oil sands emissions by 183%. Here in BC, uncounted forest management carbon emissions are now adding up to 78% of BC's overall annual climate pollution. That's right, uncounted emissions. In plantation management, the costs are hidden and deferred to the next rotation or human generation. Clear cutting, as Bob has shown, destroys water systems, air purification systems, wildlife habitat, and biodiversity. The Paris Agreement seeks climate neutrality by mid-century and names forests as a way to enhance sinks and reservoirs of greenhouse gases. So why are countries increasingly burning wood for renewable energy? You may have heard the term biofuel. Well, biofuel or biomass is taking plant material and burning it to fuel for power plants and residential heating. And there's a loophole that treats biomass as having zero emissions, despite the fact that it emits more CO2 than burning fossil fuels. So in the EU, since biomass is treated as zero CO2 emissions, because they're counting it as land use, not energy, because they don't want to double dip, even though they are, they are buying and burning wood chips from Canada and around the world, and they've spent over 6 billion euros subsidizing the wood burning industry. Some companies here are using old growth trees for wood chips or pellets to be burned. And there are concerned citizens documenting this, taking photos and proving that whole logs and hundreds to thousands of year old trees are going into these pellet plants that have popped up around BC. We need to ask the government, why are whole logs being used for pellets? Why is the BC government granting licenses to pellet companies in old growth forests? Pellet plants will become a primary forest vacuum in the same way pulp mills and sawmills have. Canada's growing wood pellet export industry threatens forests, wildlife, and our climate. In less than a decade, we have doubled our export value. Over 2.6 million metric tons of wood pellets are exported, and over 90% of our production of wood pellets is exported to Europe and Asia. That's 1.5 million metric tons to the UK and 550,000 to Japan. How can we allow a small oligopoly to control some 20 million hectares of our public forests? You may have heard of Canfor, Toco, West Fraser, Western Forest Productions. That's who's benefiting here. Forestry has been a monstrous failure under this government. We've had a de decline in allowable cut, a huge decline. Most sawmills have closed in our history. There's been a huge decline in employment, which is all a result of overcutting. Our coastal forests have flatlined in terms of output and productivity. The BC Forest Service was eliminated on its 100th anniversary when it was needed the most. The forest research branch was disbanded and even the annual reports were terminated. Forest inventory, debt and inventory and data is not kept up to date. There's no satisfactory reporting of our numbers. Forest stewardship has been weakened and nominally transferred to corporations without adequate monitoring, monitoring and oversight on plans. Vancouver Island and the South Coast has less than 1% of old growth left. The current government model is a corporate model that aims to maximize profits at the lowest dollar cost, and that is not sustainable. The rationale for conventional forestry is profits and jobs. 
but in our current forestry industry today, we have had boom and bust cycles for many rural communities with declining jobs due to raw log export and advancing technologies, as well as declining profits. Rural life is impoverished, diversity is lost, and small enterprise can't evolve because of lack of access to use public lands. We are subsidizing the forestry industry to the tune of 365 million taxpayer dollars every year. That's a million dollars a day to destroy our forests. We're creating a double climate problem. Intact forests store more carbon than logged or planted forests in ecologically comparable locations. And we're creating CO2 from cutting. So we're removing our carbon sinks and we're creating more CO2 from the cut. The forest provides lungs for our planet, purified air, oxygen, purified water, it moderates hydrological systems, minimizes sedimentation, provides wildlife habitat, habitat and biodiversity, edible and medicinal plants, carbon storage and sequestration, timber and building materials, gifts beyond value, spirituality. What's the good news? We can do better. In Sweden, they have doubled their cut, doubled their production, have added 50% more employment and 50% more new forests because of great planning. We must stop logging endangered old growth forests and immediately transition to second growth forestry in areas that are already converted. Primary forests need to be left alone. There is no such thing as sustainable logging of primary forests anymore. We must maintain biodiversity where there is a lot of it, like in these huge old stands of forests. We must implement science-based policies and form a nonpartisan organization to create new policies. Old, grown, old growth rainforests shouldn't be on the map for pellet cut blocks, full stop. Immediate action to prevent new construction or expansion of the wood pellet export facilities needs to happen, and we must end public subsidies to the wood pellet export industry. We must explore alternate models such as ecoforestry and restoration forestry, and there must be accountability and enforceability at every step of the way. We must maximize the value of every cubic meter we log so that we can log less cubic meters and move to a higher value economy. We must tell the BC government that we expect forestry legislation to ensure the prioritization of ecosystem health in forestry legislation, formal involvement of frontline communities in the management of public land, the prohibition of private corporations from having any level of authority over public land, and the destruction of nature for profit continues at breakneck speed. Now, as we rebuild our economy and society, we have an opportunity to change how we manage our forests. We can protect more of our forests. We can stop old growth logging. We can give wildlife the habitat they need to survive. We can manage our water responsibly and we can incorporate, tra incorporate traditional indigenous ecological knowledge and systems. We can't give up hope, nature is resilient. We just have to give her a chance. If there's one thing I've learned from all of this, it's that one person can make a difference because it all starts with one person, which then becomes two and three and eventually hundreds if not thousands of us all working towards creating a better forestry framework in BC for us and for all the generations to come after us. So what can you do? Claire mentioned some great points. Raise your voice, sign a petition, get involved. You have a voice, use it. We need to pressure our politicians. John Horgan, we have to let him know that this is not acceptable and the people of BC will not stand by and allow our ecosystems to collapse for the sake of corporate profits. You can vote, know who your local candidates are and what they stand for. You can educate yourself and live with purpose. Go to the Forest March BC website, watch the online summit, and find out what's really happening in our province. Spend your consumer dollars ethically and locally. We are part of nature, not apart from it. Whatever we do to the land, which is our source of life, we do to ourselves. There is one forest for all values, not a different forest for each value, and it's time that we give priority to the most important values for our well being. I'm just going to leave you with a quote from John Campbell. If you want to achieve small things, change the way you do things. If you want to achieve big things, change the way you see things. It's time to open your eyes. Thank you all so much for joining me today. And all of us here, again, thank you to all our speakers. I hope that you gained some insight and that you will hopefully take action to help stop the old growth logging that the government has no plan to stop at this time.